The following interview was conducted with Bob King, Associate Director Emeritus of Intercollegiate Athletics for the Brew University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, July 7, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. Welcome and good afternoon, Bob. My pleasure. Okay. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was, I was born in Lebanon, just down the road, but I didn't stay there long. We moved to Indianapolis when I was four, and one of my first memories is riding on the Interurban, back and forth between Lebanon, and my mom would put me on the Interurban by myself in Lebanon, and my grandmother would take me off the Interurban in Indianapolis. That was a, that was a big deal back in those days. Sure. Now they don't even have it anymore. But uh, I spent. Any, any brothers or sisters? I uh, mm. have one brother, Tom, who still lives in Carmel in Indianapolis. Uh, we went in different directions. I was totally absorbed in athletics, and Tom was in the business world. So we keep in touch, but we live in different worlds. Let's talk a little about high school. Where'd you go to high school, and then? Well, I went to Shortridge High School in Indianapolis, and. Uh, was fortunate enough to come back and coach there, and uh, that's where I was when I came to Purdue in 1960. Okay. But uh, you were involved in athletics when you were in high school, right? Yeah, Would, I, you I, I was a de no, I was a decent player. I, I wasn't real good, but I always knew that I wanted to coach. That was the only thing I ever really wanted to do. My dad was not all all that enthralled with that idea. He thought there were better ways to make a living, but uh, it, was, it was like the guy who wants to be a policeman or a firefighter or whatever. That was, that's what I wanted to do. So, right. so I spent 50 years doing it. Okay. What came after? Were there any other activities, any student activities at clubs in the high school? No, I wasn't. I really wasn't much into... into athletics took a Athletics, time. pretty much. When yeah. you... Yeah, I went from one sport to another, and uh, that was pretty much what I did. Sure. Then tell us about where'd you go to college then, and how, tell us well, about no, college that, life. That's a long story because I went to four or five different schools. Okay. Uh, again, start my, with number one. <laughs> I started out at Central Normal College, which was uh, basically a teacher's college. Is in, that in Indianapolis? In Danville, Indiana. And I went there because uh, my high school coach knew the coach, and he suggested I, that he give me a look. But anyway, I went to Central Normal, and then I went uh, down in South Carolina, at the University of South Carolina, and Newberry College, which was a small Lutheran school. I was there for a while. Then I went to Toledo University and ended up graduating from Butler. Uh, back in those days, uh, athletes going from school to school was a fairly normal thing, uh, much more so than it is today. And people asked me about it, and I said, my dad used to say, Bob, you're nothing but a tramp athlete. You're just wandering from place to place. Trying different ones out, right? But that was pretty much, I accumulated a lot of hours, and uh, and much more so than I, in fact, I graduated in Butler with oh, close to 250 hours. Right. that I'd accumulated. Did you play any uh, sports while you were Yes, I okay. played football, played basketball, mm -hmm. ran some track. Like I say, I wasn't oh, real good at anything, but I, I, I had a great, I don't know whether it's a, a gift or something, to absorb the games. I, I could learn the game. I could see things. And Coach Tony Hinkle, who my coach at Butler, said, Kid, said, you're a little slow on defense, but you're pretty good up here, he said. We need that. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, How'd your teams do? How'd the team? You didn't play Purdue, though, did you? Did you no. play Purdue in basketball, did you? We played. We huh? When I was at Butler, we played Purdue. Okay. In, uh, down at Butler Field, I played them a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had no idea that I'd ever end up at Purdue because I, I really wanted to coach at my high school, which I did. And I was kind of, I don't want to say the word content, but I guess that's what it was. I, I really never like really it. thought about leaving. All of a sudden, I had two job offers at colleges in the same week. One to go to Florida as an assistant coach to a friend of mine, and another to go to Purdue. And believe me, it was like, uh, 
the armistice after the World War. You had to decide how, how things were going. And I, I really didn't. I, I chose Purdue because my wife, Nancy, said, I don't know about going down to Florida. I know where Lafayette is. Let, let's go. <laughs> if we're going to go someplace, let's go there. Okay. But anyway, that's that how did the offer come about? Did well, you, and uh, was this for basketball? For basketball, okay. uh, Ray Eddy was the coach, and uh, uh, I had somehow developed a fairly good reputation as a scout, and, a, and uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, a person who could develop, could see talent. And, and then bring them and bring them along. Yes, so uh, they offered me a chance to come up here, and uh, again, as I said, I was never really sold on the idea because I, I liked what I was doing. But I came up here and, and met Red Mackey and Dr. Hubdy, and boy, those two guys created a great impression on me. But anyway, to make a long story short, I decided to come. And uh, what year was this when you came? 1960. Okay. 1960, and I remember coming in, and, and Red interviewed me in his office. And Ray Eddy, the basketball coach, who'd been a longtime friend, uh, he was also there. And I remember Red saying, "Kid, uh, while you're thinking about this, let's go to lunch." And he took me to the Triple X. <laughs> for lunch, my first meal in town, as in 1960, and it's still there. That's right. It's a classic. Oh, I'll say. Right. Did any of your people from uh, that you coached at Shortridge? Did they come? Any yes. Come to Purdue? Yes. Tom Pritchard, my my center, big a uh, big guy, came with me in 1960, oh. and he played on our team for four years here. Uh -huh. Later became a vice president of Little A's, made a lot more money than I did, but I still keep in touch with Tom. Sure. Okay. But he was the only player off my team that came. But he came the same time I did. Okay. He graduated okay. in 1959. Okay. Was there any military? Uh, did you ever serve in the military? Well, I was. I, I got drafted like everybody else did, and they what, sent me during, to all, during the war. Yeah. World war II? Yeah. I, I was a butler, and uh, I got drafted. And uh, at that time. Uh, they said, you're going to go to officer training school. We'll keep you right here for the next six months and this and that. And I got banged up in football that fall. I had an operation on both my knees. When I reported for duty, they wouldn't take me. So at the time, you know, I, I looked at it with, with kind of mixed emotions. Uh, you'd be a liar if you didn't, if you didn't, and yet buddies of mine were going and some of them got killed in Iwo Jima and, and places like that, Tarawa. So I look back at that as uh, something that that happened to me, over which I had no control, but everything happens for a reason, I guess. Mm -hmm. But anyway, to make a long story short, I, uh, I uh, did not uh, you didn't have to serve then? I didn't have to serve. I spent uh, oh, almost a year in the reserve mm -hmm. before they called me back. But after that, uh, I just went on my way uh, coaching. And uh, then I suddenly, all of a sudden, my coach started to see these guys coming back from the service and made me think that, you know, while while we're playing football and basketball and going through the collegiate athletic scene, guys are dying out there. And sometimes it, it makes you think about yeah. what if and all that sort, sure. sort of thing. Okay. But, what, about, uh, what about family what did when you came here? Tell us about your family. Well, I married uh, my wife, Nancy. She was a short Ridge graduate. We uh -huh. lived in the same area but did not know each other uh, before we really met when I came to Shortridge, she was Dr. Hadley, our principal, she was his secretary. Well, this and is when you were coaching after you... Yeah, coached. when I came back to coach. coach. And she, Dr. Hadley, when he hired me, uh, said, Nancy, we'll show you around, and one thing led to another. Gotcha. <laughs> On our first date, I took her with me to, to, uh, to uh, Withrow High School in Cincinnati to scout a basketball game. That's how romantic it was. <laughs> she, 
She never let me forget that. <laughs> well, that's, said, what I'm, that's one of the things I'm doing. I said, I noticed you went, though. And she said, yeah, that was my first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, we got married in 51 or 2, I can't remember. Uh, and we have two children. Uh, Mike, my son, lives in Carmel. Susie, my daughter, lives in Schaumburg, Illinois. And uh, both of them graduated from, from Purdue. Mike was a, a member of the golf team for four years on a scholarship and a very good player. Uh, temper, even though he had a temper and threw a lot of clubs, he was a pretty good player. Uh, Susie, uh, as soon as she graduated, she worked in the sports publicity office for two or three years. Here on campus? Here at campus. And now she's married to Mark Rudner, who is the associate commissioner of the Big Ten. And, and so our house is kind of divided. He's from Ohio State. She's from Purdue. They both have pennants. One of my grandsons goes to Iowa, in fact, just graduated. The other one goes to Illinois. So we have a Big Ten family, and there's all kinds of arguments going back and forth. <laughs> All kinds of betting too. Huh? Yeah, right. but that in a, in a quick capsule is that's sort of nice. Is where we are. I get to see Mike quite often. I don't get to see Susie as often, but right. Mike and I spend a lot of time together. We go to ball game. He comes to take me to the basketball and football games, and one of my perks is we sit in the press box and have great seats. He loves that. He thinks that's great. You mean at Ross Aid? <laughs> yeah. And at, at Mackey? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In fact, my basketball seats are right next to Morgan Burke, the athletic director. He and I sit together, and I keep him calm down because he gets excited at the <laughs> officials every now and then. Uh, well, uh, let's start with, uh, so what were your responsibilities, and tell us a little bit about what things that you did when you came for the basketball. Well, when I, I first came to Purdue, my, my job, first and last, was to recruit basketball players. For quite some time in high school, I was uh, on the board of the Indiana Basketball Coaches Association. Later I became, after I retired from, not retired, but I quit basketball coaching here, I became executive director. And it's an association with, uh, oh, every school in state, college and high school in the state school of and Indiana. College? And in the state of Indiana. Okay. And so I had a lot of contacts all over the state. You and, need that. And with that, we were able to recruit some pretty good basketball players. Rick Mount, Billy Keller, uh, uh, Bruce Parkinson, uh, Dave Shellhouse, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of good players. What about recruiting just within the community here? Well, uh, we had several really good players come through Jeff High School. Mm -hmm. Danny Brady, we were able to recruit him. Al McFarland, another very good player. Uh, sometimes in athletics, there's an old adage that, uh, I don't remember how it goes now, you're too close to the forest to see the trees. Sometimes we think that everything that's, the further away it is, the better it is. And we get caught in up in that sometimes. Yeah. And, we, and we lose fact that there's some pretty good players right close to home. And, uh, I, I got reminded of that several times, guys, that I, that I either overlooked or didn't think were good enough, and they proved me wrong. But uh, oh, that often happens. Yeah, yeah, recruiting was something I really loved. It was hard on our family because you had to be gone an awful lot. But it more than made up for it by getting to meet. And I'm talking about back in the days between 1960 and 1980. It was a much simpler task then because you really only had to convince mom and dad and the high school coach. Those are the people that the kids in those days looked to for guidance. It isn't that way today. Recruiting today involves agents, people on the, on the sidelines who want to get their hands in the thing. Uh, and there's a lot I'm, of polls. I'm getting eloquent rank. here, and, and I should There's a lot of, of ranking and polls yeah, and things like that. I shouldn't be getting all this excited when I put But your song has changed. Yes, things have changed. The recruiting today that Matt Painter has to face is a totally different way than, than we did back in the 60s and, and 70s for about a 20 year period. 
for almost 20 years, I saw between 200 and 250 basketball games a year. That's a lot of basketball games. And, uh, Did you recruit uh, nationally? Oh, you, yes. Okay. Yeah. Not only necessarily yeah. in the Midwest? Most of the time, you can get enough players close to Indiana in, in the Midwest area to take care of your needs. But every now and then, you need to go after, for example, Herman Gilliam was uh, probably as good a basketball player as there was in the Southeast. He was from Winston-Salem. And a friend of mine, Billy Packer, who used to announce national TV basketball games, was the coach at Winston-Salem. And he said, Bob, there's a guy down here, he was a friend of mine. He said, there's a kid down here we can't take because our schools will not recruit black athletes. At that time, in the 60s, it was a no-no. He said, the word is they're going to change that rule and allow us to recruit him. And he said, we can't afford to have him go he wants to go away from home. We can't afford to have him go to North Carolina or Duke or something. He said, I'll help you get him to Purdue. And he did. And he turned out to be one of the best players ever to play here, ever. I recognize his name. Oh, yeah. Herman died uh, a year and a half ago, unfortunately, but he was a, he was a great, great player. What about, um, let me inter interject this, financial assistance and scholarships, how did that fall in within this 20-year uh, Well, we had Big Ten rules and NCAA rules, both of which we had to adhere to sure. when we gave scholarships. And uh, the scholarships normally consist of room, board, books, fees, and tuition. That's pretty much the, the basics. Now, that doesn't cover everything, as you well know. And what was a normal scholarship, and, and I, my memory doesn't, I'm going to guess it was, uh, oh, 16, 1800 dollars for an in-state guy when I first came here. Right. That's the 60s, okay. Oh yeah, okay. now it's okay. thousands of dollars, that's yeah. how things are going up, right, like yeah. they have in your particular department. Right. But uh, one of the, the real side benefits that I retain to this day from recruiting is that there's hardly a week goes by that a former player doesn't call me and say, Coach, let's go to lunch. It's wonderful. Yeah. Particularly when they buy. <laughs> right. but, but it's so uh, nice to, that means a lot, the relationship oh, to the context. And uh, you mentioned Rick Mount. He and Billy Keller and Ralph Taylor and I, we have lunch two or three times a year down at a little place in Thorntown because it's close to Lebanon and it's close sure. to Lafayette. Right. And those, those meetings are priceless. Right. Yeah. They're all better players. They're much better today than they were when they were playing. You remember this, Coach? Yeah. You know, I don't remember this 30 points when it was really 20, but it gets that way sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But that's, that's a, a side benefit I wouldn't trade for anything. And then you went to all the games. There were as many games as there are now, pretty much? More, more, more games more. today than okay. there were. We used to have a, a schedule of only 24 games. Now we can play 29. Okay, okay. So it's like everything else, we want the money. We, we need the money. And but of course you didn't have TV in those days either. No. How many of them were on TV? No. I remember when TV really got started. Uh, and that was about the time you came here, I see, late 60s, early 70s, and we started getting a quote-unquote kind of a network of, of games of the Big Ten School. Channel 4 from Bloomington used to be the first channel that broadcast the games. But uh, I still, I look at some of those old films and think, boy, the game has changed. Short pants, fur haircuts. But, uh, I see the outfits too and the debris and it's oh, very yeah. different. <laughs> it's, it's very different, but it's still the same game. And you can't beat playing Indiana in Mackey Arena. Uh, there's going to be blood on the floor. That's, that's just the way it is. Sure, that's right. Who, was Bobby Knight, a co was he coach? Yes, Bob came, Bob came to Indiana in 72. Oh, okay. And I had known him before. In fact, he had written me several times. 
to ask about some kids that Army was recruited. They recruited different this kind of kids. This is when he was at the... Uh, he was the head coach at Army. Right, at and the he, military academy. He'd ask West my Point. opinion on this kid or that kid. Our kind of friendship went on and on. And he was, uh, believe me, he was uh, a controversial person in our department, just like he was to the general public. People, they could never understand, how can you get along with that guy? You know, he's such a quote-unquote, and I'd say, he's got his good side. You don't see it very often, but he does. It's there. And I remember very well when Nancy passed away, I got a wonderful letter from him. Didn't have to write it, but he did. So you make a lot of friendships. That's right. What... Uh in during those years at 1680, what was the uh, recruit after the graduation? A lot of them go to the NBA. And well, uh, how is how see is the that? NBA? We, uh, it in, didn't really. For example, in 68, 69, this ring is a. We almost won the championship that year. We got beat by UCLA in the finals. And out of that team, two of those guys, Keller Mount, played in the ABA, which was the other league at that time. And they both signed big contracts, made a lot of money. Uh, George Faber, who was on that team, and Chuck Davis, they got drafted by NBA teams. Neither one of them went on to play, but I mean, we had the ABA and the NBA. The, the NBA was in what they called growing pains then. It was, it was trying to expand, and Indianapolis was one of the ABA teams that eventually went into the NBA. Okay. But uh, we've had several players that pl Bob Ford also played a little pro right. bowl, and he was in school when, at, just after you first came. And uh, we haven't had all that many pro basketball players, but we've had, uh, I'm going to guess, in my 35 years here, I'm going to guess we had uh, 8 to 10 guys who played some in, in the pro league. After graduation. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about Title IX, how that changed the program. It really brought a big change into things. And I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you it brought some, what's the word I want to use? Well, anyway, things didn't always go real smoothly at first, as you might There's imagine. There's some growing pains. Well, sure, because the men, were used to their world. And here all of a sudden are another group of athletes who were going to try just as hard to be good, and they want some space. And it didn't always go easy. But uh, we, uh, we went into the uh, Title IX thing just like all the other schools did, and each year things got a little better for the women's program. Now the feelings sometimes weren't much better, but that too got better and better. But while this was going on, something happened to our athletic department. Until 19, until... Uh, were you still involved in recruiting at that? Well, see, Title IX is 72, so you still were involved in Oh yeah, in I was football. involved in recruiting clear up to sure. almost 1980. Okay. But uh, uh, prior to uh, about 19, well, when they built Mackey Arena, 67. All of the athletic parks are located in one building. You saw everybody every day. In Lambert. In Lambert. Everybody. All the sports were within shouting distance. You built this Mac one building. Yeah, one building. Except for the football field. Yeah. Well, the football coaches were all in there too. Okay. Okay. See, there wasn't a, the football building wasn't built yet. Okay. But then we built Mackey Arena and put basketball offices in there. Then we built the football building here and put the football people in there. In Molenkoff? In Molenkoff. Okay. And then all of a sudden, now you look, we've got a golf facility where golf is its own little empire. We've got a tennis facility. We've got a swimming facility. Nobody sees anybody anymore. That big happy family that we used to have. And well, I, I say happy, it was pretty happy. considering it's Kind of like a family. Now it's all spread out, yeah. and it's nobody's fault. It's just that when you get bigger, you spread out. Things change. Right. Yeah. Interesting. 
Then um, you switch. Uh, let's talk about the uh, became academic affairs associate. Sort of yeah, and that's something I I I really didn't want to get into that. But George King, who's the athlete, said, "Bob, we need somebody to start a, a tutor program on an athletic uh, counseling system." He said, "Will you do it?" He said, "I'm not telling you you got to," but he said, "Will you do it?" Well, I love coaching, and I'd been coaching till I was a hundred, probably. <laughs> but anyway, this this was something that. I knew something about because I'd, I'd been kind of shepherding athletics for the football and the basketball guys anyway, getting them a tutor here and there and counseling and all that sort of stuff. So we, with the help of half a dozen other people, we got a, a program started in which we started actually recruiting tutors and categorizing them with their skills and setting up uh, program or not program but schedules where athletes had to come in at certain times to be talked to or with whether they liked it or not and uh, it just kept growing and growing and much better people than me took over it and are running it now and I marvel at how big it is and how good it is now but it's a big business oh, yeah. when you talk about touring at 10 to 20 dollars an hour and kids sometimes using hundreds of hours in order. It's, it's, it's big business. And I get questioned by people here who, who don't understand that, that kids need help sometimes, sure. regardless of how good does. you are. Everybody does. I can remember back my first year, uh, I was fortunate when I came here, we had a Rhodes Scholar, Bob Orrell, Terry Dishner, an academic All-American, and Tim McGinley, chairman of the board, who was a straight-A student. He even played though, basketball. And played basketball. I used to tell Tim, I said, Tim, you can't guard anybody, Tim. You're a lousy defensive player, which he was. But he, he could shoot, and he was smart. He was tall, and he's tall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I told him one day, in fact, I, when he retired, he answered a letter that I'd sent him congratulating him on it. He said, did you ever think I'd end up being amounting to anything? Is what he said. I said, Coach, I knew you. I said, Tim, I knew you'd make a lot of money someday because he was smart. But anyway, I'm digressing from that. But the 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 academic support system is something that we had to do because the advent of the women's program made us realize that that we, we had to do more than we had been doing. And over the years, I found out that the, the gals were not near the academic problem the guys were. Had fewer academic problems among them. Had a lot of emotional pro problems, which I wasn't, I never will forget, I won't mention the young lady's name, she was a track athlete. She came in, closed the door of my office, said, Coach Bob, I'm pregnant. Now I'm, a I'm not a naive guy, but all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, now what am I supposed to say? What, how, how am I supposed to react to this? But anyway, to make a long story short, she was concerned because the young man wasn't here and she was gonna have a baby and didn't have anybody to help. Well, anyway, we got the thing resolved, but that typical, well, no, it wasn't typical, but it was things that you got to have. Things that, that you got to have, along. and you can't say, uh, don't bother me, I can't talk to you about that. You got to listen. Sure. And that was what I did for a lot of years. I listened. And for and a lot of kids, for a lot of kids, that's all they wanted sure. was somebody to listen. It's better to kind of talk it out and run it by somebody that they feel comfortable interacting and, with. Uh, there were some things you couldn't do much about, but I think sometimes they left thinking, well, they, they got it off their chest and talked a little bit. Right, yeah. So when you talk about a counseling and academic program, a lot of times it involves just being there for them. That's right. And uh, 
but it was it was very and now today they have taken it to a much higher level they have well, I don't know how many people. Ed Howard used to be our one of our managers in basketball. He now runs it. And I guess Ed probably got eight people working for him. Eight people. I can remember when we started with just one or two of us and didn't know what we were doing. But uh, We just get better. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not saying anything that probably some of these things relate to your areas, That's too. Right. As you grow, you... Well, you look back and you re you you remember a lot of things, which is really nice. Let's talk about athletic directors. So, Guy Mackey and then George King. Yeah. Were there Red, differences between? There were two different. Oh, people? Red Mackey was one of the most wonderful guys I ever met. He was a hard-nosed, tough, uh, river bottom, as he called a redneck. He said, "I'm a redneck, Bob." Is he from? Was he from Indiana? He was from New Albany. They lived down on the river bottom okay. on the line. But Red was one of those kind of guys, he didn't keep records or, he, if he shook hands with you, I guess that was the way it was done. Now he had his faults, he was, the women's program would have been a real blow to him because he would not have understood it. And as George King once said, he said, Title IX, he said, Red's probably turning over in his grave if he knew about this. But that's just the way he was. Uh, and, and I don't. I'm not trying to make fun of it. No, I you're not. Hope you believe me. He was just a, a very personal. But Red was a, a wonderful guy, and Dr. Hubdy was in my office a lot because he liked to talk about athletics, and I thought that was great. Here's the head man sitting down, uh, and then George took over as AD. And he had been basketball coach. George I'm had thinking been of the researchers coach. before right. that. Okay. Right. And we both had the same name, but we were not related. But we played games with people because George would say, "No, no, I'm not the. That's not the king. You should be talking. You should be talking to Bob." And I'd say the same thing. George is to blame. I didn't do this. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then John Hicks became an interim while we were carrying over. After George re retired. And George was uh, John was a wonderful guy to be with too. He did. He got things done in a very quiet manner, without drawing attention to himself. And our present director is outstanding. Morgan's done a great job, in my opinion. He, like he said, he didn't know anything about basketball, and he only knew that officials were bad. He didn't think they were good. But he said, "I expect you to teach me those things, Bob." And that's why we sit together. And <laughs> but we've been very fortunate. They have. We needed a guy like Morgan because he had great business background. And we, were, we were entering a world where money was the most important thing. I was going to talk about funding. That's really oh, ch changed. That takes Before that, when in the early years when you first came, was there fundraising? I mean, of course, you always had the John Purdue Club. The John Purdue Club and only, that's changed over only time. consisted of about a hundred or so people when I when I first came here. Okay. It was already going when you Yeah, came. it had just been started just a year or two before that by a, right. a group of mostly Lafayette-sponsored guys. But those were people who Red could go to for money for things that came up that you just couldn't get in the budget. And every school has them. And then they finally decided to, I guess, incorporate or make it a and it, each year it just kept getting bigger and bigger. I can remember for many, many years going to hundreds of uh, golf outings, talks at very small towns or big towns. You would be doing this? Oh, I would, I would sure. help go. All, all the coaches would go. Sure. And uh, a lot of times, uh, I don't know whether you know Maury Williamson? I met him. I did interview Maury. Many times I would go with Maury to the Ag hey. alum, because those, they were great boosters and financial supporters. And Maury would say, now Bob, <laughs> he knew every farmer in the state, huh? And he said, now we're going to go from here to here, and we're not going to go through a single town. We're going to take back roads. Well, I could tell you a million stories about Maury, but uh, what a wonderful guy. He I knew can, all the back roads, I understand. I can see why our ag people are so loyal to Purdue because the guys like him. But yeah, we, uh, the John Purdue Club kept growing and growing and, 
uh, along the way they started getting more and more people involved on the staff till we have a full-time staff that does nothing but probably the most important thing for it. You've got to have money coming right. in. Yeah. Did John Purdue um, help with, say, the mound, those buildings? You had to have a driveway for the building of the mound. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And of yeah. course, I know we know about the Mackey one, but yeah. mound coffers. And then the expansion of Ross A. Sure. Mm -hmm. That all comes from, I'm a John Purdue member. My son, Mike, and my daughter, Susie, they're all law members. And, uh, probably joined out in self-defense because I told him to. But it, it's like anything else. If, if you want your, what's that expression, keeping up with the Joneses? If you want your school to be as good as Michigan or Ohio State or Illinois or something like that, you, you have to pay for it. You got to keep giving the support. I wish there was a better way to describe it, but that's cold-bloodedly <laughs> what you got to do. It's, a, it's become a business. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you about uh, uh, Johnny DeCamp. Oh, John and and his wife Ann and Nancy were really close friends, mm -hmm. and we spent a lot of time together. And John was a just a, he was, he was a wonderful guy. He was pretty set in his ways about certain things, but he relished being called the voice of Purdue. He that was to him his high water mark. And he was the voice of Purdue. Mm -hmm. People I would meet at these various places. What's that guy who does the radio for? Which is, they, they, they couldn't remember his name sometimes. And they knew him from the Indy 500? As sure. Well, in addition. Sure. And John was just, he, he passed away too quickly. I mean. mm -hmm. Let me, uh, one thing I thought the researchers, if you just clarify, the uh, revenue versus non-revenue sports. Okay. Uh, just make a comment on that. Well, the revenue. Sometimes they may read a little yeah. bit. Yeah. The revenue scores are basically tied up in just two things: football and basketball. Those bring in the money. Uh, all the other sports operate at a at a loss. Uh, not an overall loss, but you know the, the bottom line. Uh, wrestling spends more money than they take in because. You don't get very many people to, or to a cross country. Now, the thing people don't understand is that they say, well, you want to get rid of those sports that don't make any money. But you have to understand that guy who runs the cross country race works just as hard as that all American guy does in football. Except he does in front of nobody. This guy does in front of 60,000 people. But you can't get people to understand that. And as a result, sometimes it created a little. I don't mean bad feelings, but a, a kind of a look from the football and basketball people and saying, we run things, you guys just come along for the ride. I, I don't know whether I'm phrasing it the right what you're way. Saying, yeah. But uh, having been in right in the middle of the athlete park for years, I can, I can remember that, uh, that uh, the money issue was always one that sure. But the, some sort but the sports have been, have increased. You've got a lot of athletes now in the oh, facility, yeah. so it's it's come along. So they all you know. Yeah. Participate. When I when I left Purdue, retired in '95, I think it was. We probably had oh, three or four hundred athletes in, in all. Of it. I'm yeah, sure now we got over five hundred oh. easily. Oh sure, easily. Sure. And the sports keep getting bigger and bigger and demanding more attention. And the coach that coaches this sport thinks his sport is just as good and just as important as the coach that coaches this sport. Because it all falls into the whole operation of but the community. But keeping all of those coaches happy is a tremendous job for the athletic director. That's why I have great respect for, for Morgan. He, first of all, he, he, he is not a a football basketball guy or wasn't when he came on board he said by golly we're going to have a level playing field we're going to take care of everybody and he's done a wonderful job in that in fact without him women's athletics would not be as good at Purdue as it is because he really championed them and did a, did a great job but uh, I look back and think, would Red have done the same thing? He wouldn't have known how to. Probably not. He was raised in a different time. You know. <laughs> different, totally right. different right. feeling about right. things. Yeah. Let's move on. We'll talk about uh, awards and honors. Let's talk about a few of them. The Bob and Nancy King Endowed Scholarship for Athletics. Well, that, that happened because 
some of those former players that I helped recruit. Uh, when Nancy passed away, they thought that'd be a good way to honor her. And for years, she helped distribute the books to the athletes. This was a non-paying job. She just did it. We got her out of the house, I think. <laughs> but she learned to to know a lot of those men and women athletes, and I think some of them remembered her in that in, in that project. What is the scholarship? What uh, well, would you want recipients? What does it well, it, it, make it, the it just goes to a an athlete selected by there's a board that sure. selects somebody and awards them the, the uh, like the tuition fees and stuff like that for the school year. So uh, I can't tell you the name. This year there was a, a girl swimmer by, uh, I should know her name, but I can't think of it. Do they keep in touch? Uh, do you get to meet them? Do you go to when the award oh, is given out? Uh, the first year I did, but sure. I haven't since that time, since I moved over here. I, sure. Uh, they still keep a desk over at the arena and a, and a phone, and I can talk to a secretary. But when I go over there, I know they say, now, "Bob, just stay the hell out of the way." Pardon yeah. my expression. <laughs> <laughs> You've been inducted in the Intercollegiate Athletics Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't know That's why. That's very nice. How did that uh, announcement come to you? Uh, Morgan called me, and. Uh, was your wife still alive at that time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I said, what does this really mean? He said, well, Coach, I'll tell you, it means you're old. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're getting your due. Is that yeah. it? That's the next <laughs> sentence. Uh, the Bob King Assist Award, that's named in honor uh, for, uh, well, for, for dedicated to Purdue Yeah, that's, a, that's an award that's given each year to the basketball, basketball. player who makes the most passes that lead to a basket. Usually it's a guy who is an unselfish, uh, will not shoot the ball, he'd rather give it to somebody else who's in a better position. Uh, and can probably make the basket. And can, is a better, better shooter than me. And uh, I've always felt that was, because that's kind of like the way I played. I couldn't shoot very well, but I could pass pretty good. That's key. And. Uh, I, I always think that that award goes to guys who played maybe a little bit like I did, one way or another. So I'm I'm very proud of that. That's very, uh, and that's given at the annual banquet each year. One, a player gets it. Do you usually go to the ba banquet? Oh, I used to go every year. Uh -huh. Last couple of years, I haven't been going. All right. Okay. And then the um, you also were inducted in the uh, Indiana Basketball Hall. Yeah, of I'm I'm. Uh, on the board of directors of the basketball hall, have been for over 24 years now. Okay. And uh, I'm still pretty active with it in that I, I try to go to meetings and I, I try to get involved with things that are going on because I'm, I'm just a, a guy who, who was brought up in Indiana liking basketball. That's just the way it was, a way of life. And my, it's like the houses, every house has got the basketball yeah. right there. Right. And believe me, people, I get joked about here by people that say, well, you don't know my hometown. Romney, Economy, Patricksburg. I said, I've been in those. I've been in every gym in Indiana, which I have. Every high school gym in Indiana, <laughs> I've been in. Because I was going to give you an award for that. Because that's what I was supposed to do. That's right. And so I've become a little bit of a historian. I'm, right now I'm writing or trying to put together a history of the Indiana Basketball Coach Association, which started in 1970. Well, each year it gets longer and longer and I have trouble keeping up. But that's good to do that because but I'm, be I'm trying to keep, keep those, as long as my memory keeps, somebody said, there are things you can take, Bob, to help your memory. <laughs> yeah, you still keep active in the, uh, uh, collegiate coaches, are you still active the, in that as well? Collegiate and high school coaches were all in, in the basketball coaches. Talking about, let's talk about for a moment on basketball and high school, how that's changed over time. Well, there's more, both men and there's 
Oh know. yeah, girls basketball brought about a change in boys basketball for one simple reason. The girls were the best fans of the boys basketball. Now if you got girls basketball, the girls' interest is diverted. That, nobody's fault, that's just the way it is. And the parents have to, you have to decide, do a, okay, I go watch my son play, but I go, go watch my daughter play too. So it, there was a sociological change in our habits as well as just the girls are playing, you know, and the boys are playing. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not a big girls basketball fan as an old hardliner, but they've come a long way. They've, they've come a long way. And they've got their pro team as well. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the people that play in pros have done pretty well. Yeah, they'll, they'll never get to be on the same level as the boys, but I, the, point, the point is we're given. My daughter was a pretty good athlete, but when she was at West Side, they didn't have girl sports. They were just limited to intramurals. They, they just, you know, she wanted so badly to, to play basketball, to run track, to play golf, which she's good in all of them. But uh, it, it's like anything else. Uh, we had to understand that we can't continue to deny half of our population a chance to do this or that or what it did. Uh, gave them the right to vote or not gave them, but they, they got the right to vote, so. It's to level the people. But it, it, it's created some, some real problems school-wise. Yeah, uh, you asked me something in particular. Uh, how the high school has just oh, changed. Oh, high just school changed, athletics yeah, now. What's there's, the boys, boys and the girls? There's and so many other things for the kids to do. You go to the high school gyms now, both boys and girls games. And you, you, you pretty much they use the same gym, pretty much? Probably many of the high yeah. schools. Yeah, and that's why they have to do it on different nights. Sure. And, well, uh, that's true here with Mackey. Yeah, sure. That's why we're building another practice facility so the girls will have a place to practice. Now, part of the time, Matt's got to practice at 6 o'clock, and part of the time, Sharon's got to practice at 6 o'clock. And now, if you give them another or practice to a little they can go practice. But uh, so much of, of basketball history is tied up in, in our society's history. Different people look at things differently. Sports used to be the biggest thing in the small towns in Indiana. The biggest thing. That was the reason that they evolved. They, the town spirit was evolved around that team, football, basketball, whatever it was. And then they started the reorganization problem, which was started by a Purdue guy, Heavy Kohlmeyer, back, back in the, I mean, he wasn't his fault, but I mean, he was the guy that helped got it, get it underway. They evolved and the schools went down from close to 900 to about 400 cents. And it took the identities away from these small towns. That was hard for a lot of people to accept. Some of them still don't. Because they've grown up with it. Yeah. Oh yeah, they've, they've learned, to, learned to live with it. But in so doing, we have to realize that, that the kids today don't face going to school, playing athletics, working on the farm, going to sleep, starting it all over the next day. Now they got a million things to do, and as a result, it's taken away a lot of interest from, from yeah. athletics, yeah. and maybe from education too. I don't know. Yeah, could be. That's right. What now about instead of reading, we we put we put it on a computer. Or something <laughs> like that. How about retirement activities? What uh, oh, do you do? I still, like I said, I'm on the board of directors sure. of the Hall of Fame and the Indiana Basketball Coach. So I still work with those two groups. Uh, I. And you also go to the sports? No, no. Basketball, you still go to the games? Oh, I, yeah, go, I, I go to the games. Yeah, I, I go to Purdue, to the Purdue games, and do occasionally... To, do you go to football as well as the basketball? Yes. Occasionally, I'll go to a high school game. Uh, I have trouble getting around without somebody going with me. But uh, there are quite a few times when a former player or a former coach or somebody will say, Bob, we're going to this day, it won't go long, we'll pick you up. So, so I go, and that keeps, that kind of keeps me involved. 
I'm a, I'm a, I like to be in the sports world. junkie. That's okay. <laughs> How about a favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have a, one of those? Do you have a tradition, a per, favorite one? Oh. Anyone comes to mind? And how about an outstanding event? Oh, gosh. Oh, I remember. There were so many the things. Boilermaker Special might be one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember my first ride on the Boilermaker Special. And that was quite a while ago. But most of my, my fondest memories are tied up with... Uh, Recollections of people like I told you, Red Mackey, sure. Dr. Hubby, George King, players like Mount Keller, uh, people like that. Uh, I remember very well as a young man, I helped recruit in 1962. His name was Gary Bancroft. And he had unlimited possibilities there, Matthew. But he was, he fought demons all the time. He, he never could see anything just like it was. What if, or what if. He, he it wasn't good enough, or he wasn't good enough. But to make a long story short, he got killed in a trampoline accident at, just after leaving our practice, summer practice. He went upstairs to the gym he got on the trampoline. He was a gifted athlete. And he miscalculated, broke his neck. Just killed me at the time, selfishly, because he, he, was, he was a guy I knew, his family I knew. But he was an athlete that could really have been great. And here he was, gone. I never will forget that. Uh, I remember this championship game. Losing, when you got the ring? Yeah, losing to UCLA. They, that's as good as it gets. You're, you're playing the best team in the country. And Rick played well, but we played without our center, Chuck Davis. He, he hurt his shoulder the game before, couldn't play. We had to shoot Gilliam and Keller in the ankle pain stuff so that they could play. We still played pretty good, but we got beat. I kid, but I kid Rick. I said, "What do you think we'd be? If we'd had everybody healthy." He said, "Coach, instead of losing by twenty, we might have lost by 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! But that was what you play for. You play to get to be the best, and we we, we were close. I remember that game very well. I remember the first time we played Butler. That was a funny feeling for me. I bet. And uh, sure, uh, they they beat us on the last second shot by one of my former high school players, Bob Williams, who played the charters for me. <laughs> and yeah. Ray Eddie said, Bob King. He said, Well, the reason we got you here is that we want to beat those damn guys. <laughs> he didn't tell me I was fired, but he's probably thinking of it. Uh, first game, mm -hmm. not first game, first time we played. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have lots of memories. Any uh, balls in your court? Any as you look back? Any closing comments that you'd like to share with us? That you think it well, covered some really interesting things. Just the and you keep you keep active and keep in touch. Coming to West Lafayette was a real challenge for Nancy and I, you know, big city people. But she learned to love the place. It's like a great place to live and raise kids. And uh, I've often wondered so many times had I taken the other path, gone to Florida, uh, stayed at Indianapolis, but instead I came the other way. And then, uh, never regretted a single day. That, that's about all I can yeah, say. You, you can't do much better than come to Purdue. Now, you did that. Now, I don't know how it compares with the area that you came from, but you evidently liked it. You wouldn't have stayed. Right. And also, I was born and raised in the Midwest. Oh. I've lived there most of my yeah. life. Yeah. So. yeah, you wouldn't have had the cultural thing like coming from the Deep South or New <laughs> England or someplace like that. 
Bob, we want to thank you very much for oh, this. It's, it's been very my pleasure. Nice. Thank I you. get started, you can't turn me off. Well